I, I get an email. They say, do you want to come to do this thing? I say, sure. Then they praise me for two hours <laughs> and let me talk about whatever the hell comes through my brain. Like, this was a pretty good deal for me. <laughs> like, this works out fine for me. I hope it was good for you. everybody to another episode of world one one i am your host larry the nordic beast uh with me as always is eddie the nestle wonderball chocolate magic head and joining us as well this week is conrad zimmerman yay oh uh, oh let's not get too excited <laughs> conrad zimmerman on the show like this is crazy this is straight bunkers i love conrad uh your tweets I, you know what i think you should be a comedy writer because the your tweets are hilarious. Like, oh, thank you, do I, I? Yeah, it's it's one of those things that I like. I have actually been considering lately because I mean, a lot of the stuff that I'm doing now. Uh huh. Uh, I, I I mean, I've been writing about I've been writing about video games for a long time, and that's how you know I got into podcasting and all that. But I don't really, apart from my other job of making video games, I don't. I'm not really engaged in that, but I do a lot of comedy stuff now um, between the the two podcasts that I do with Jim. That's really become my focus uh, in, in recent years. So it's really very, very kind of you to say that. Um, I, I, I joke with my wife that I'm going to start calling myself a comedian now because I, I have actually made money doing it. And that's that's better than a lot of people. That is so true. So I can start saying that, I guess. I'm not going to. Uh, I, if you ever write a book, I, I want to be the first one to buy it. <laughs> uh, yeah, because you, in fact, you actually got an audio book out. I didn't even know that. Oh yeah, I well, I, yeah, I did. I recorded uh, an audio book of the Call of the Wild um, because, like, it, I secretly always wanted to be a radio DJ when I was a kid. Back when I thought radio DJs got to pick the music, wow. and and that people have was overrated. Yeah, it's that's that you know, it, it's not a, it would not when I when I found out that they didn't have that kind of control over the you know the culture, uh-huh. uh, I was like screw that if it's all programmed who cares, but um, yeah I've I I have a face and a voice for radio um, I've been told, um, which so I decided I was going to just read books and th- this was something in, back when I thought I was going to have kids, that I would do. Right. Like I was going to it was a great grand plan of mine that I was going to record myself reading all of these books to pipe into audio, you know, pipe into speakers in the in the crib while the child slept. And this would serve two purposes for me. One, um, you know, obviously I get to sort of embed, implant all sorts of ideas into this child's mind at a very formative times you know things things relating to you know like i can I, they can have the art of war and and the prince and have all of that you know sort of firm psychological grounding on which to produce a a, a real manipulative son of a bitch down the road but uh <laughs> more importantly it, it means that uh you know because i'm reading all of these things they're going to have a stronger connection to me than they would to my wife uh and 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 therefore I, I would have leverage in any such situations where I would require the child uh, to be on my side in a dispute with my wife. <laughs> oh, that's so devilish! But I love that. I, I but, thought but my it was... wife and I decided that you know we're not going to have kids. So instead, I, you know, I was like, but I still want to do this. I still want to record 
myself reading <laughs> books. It's, it's so narcissistic sounding when I say it, but uh, I thought, well, you know, I, there's public domain books out there. I'll just read those. And uh, and so I've done Call of the Wild. I'm working on another one. I keep saying I'm working on it. I've had multiple people ask me, oh, yeah, I'm working on it. Uh, but I, I haven't touched it in like three months because I moved. But I'm, I'm hoping to get back to that in the next couple of weeks because I'm a couple chapters from finishing The Time Machine by H.G. Wells. Uh, ah. So, and then I've got others I want to do. So yeah, that's a sort of a long, long-term project. Um, writing a book sounds like a lot of work. I would love to hear your interpretation of, hey, God, it's Margaret. So I could just want to be like, this is not right. <laughs> you like, Oh, yeah, that does sound dangerous. Um, <laughs> but yeah, well, everybody, if you don't know, Comrade Zimmerman used to write for Destructoid. He used to be on Potsoid, was a guest on Retro Force Go, um, did a lot of video, uh, did the Hey Homes or, or no, Sub Homes series. Sub Homes, yeah. And, uh, and he he does a lot now with Jim Sterling. Um, and you can, uh, Fish Shark is his website, correct? Or, uh, is uh, that the... yeah, fishshark.com. Yeah. Fish Shark Marketing. That's, uh, our, our sort of unscripted comedy podcast where, uh, Jim and I play executives at a sort of shadowy conglomerate, uh, running their marketing company and, uh, and get into all sorts of mishaps with celebrity clients and, and, dangerous products that we uh, produce and sell. And uh, yeah, it's, it, it it's a, cause we used to do um, a lot of uh, shock value humor, maybe is what you'd call it um, back in the pod toy days. And then with the, the subsequent show, um, the dismal jesters that, that we did with Jonathan Holmes. Uh-huh. And um, we still wanted to, have a like a creative outlet but i wanted something with a little more structure um something with a setting and something that could have a sort of a, an emerging plot um so the shows now i guess we just put out our 117th episode oh congrats um, thank you yeah it's it's still chugging along we started in uh, 2014 and you now we, we get an episode out most weeks and it's uh that's fun. Like every 50 episodes, it, it's shaped up now that we have some sort of arc somehow uh, mm-hmm. that has developed over the 50 episodes and, and winds up concluding there. And and it's been fun figuring out what those are because we don't have any sort of plan going into any of this. It's, um, you know, we, the, the, the way Jim and I, I do it, we just get together and, and bullshit. For like an hour, hour and a half, and somewhere along the line, we're like, "Hey, we should come up ide- with ideas for this show that we're gonna do," and and like it's only recently that I've actually started like writing down things uh-huh. <laughs> to keep track of them. <laughs> it's all just sort of remained in my head, and I'm I'm I mean I'm I'm really pleased because it's it's maintained consistency for over a hundred episodes without like completely. F- caving in on itself uh, <laughs> and its own lore um, so that's good yeah. but uh it's not it's at a point now where i have things that like i'd like to do with it i have i have a lot of loose plot threads that i i i've left open and, and story seeds that i planted and thought yeah i'll get to that eventually that I'll, i've lost track of and so I've been going back through the old episodes <laughs> and, and, and just and hearing all of these things that I, I, I say yeah. that I know I had the full intent like three, four, six episodes later, I planned was going to be a thing and never was. Wow. Totally forgotten about. And so now I'm starting to dredge those up. <laughs> uh, that, that's <laughs> Everything that got lost. Yeah, yeah. I, and I'm, and I'm putting it all. And I'm, I'm getting like an actual internal document and organization going, which is maybe far more uh, effort than than this actually deserves. But it's it's funny because it's the show that I, Jim and I, have both sort of expressed this uh, to each other and and in things. It's like it's the thing we're most proud of, 
and it's like the least listened to thing that we've ever done. Oh, wow. Like, it, it has it has a very dedicated audience that uh, like is it's awesome that it's there. It's just not hugely popular, and we don't we're terrible at marketing it, and that's kind of the irony because we're doing a show oh, playing wow. marketers who are incompetent. <laughs> And are ourselves incompetent at marketing said <laughs> podcast. Uh, uh, so, yeah, but it's 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 still fun. And uh, and and yeah, I hope people listen to it. I hope well, more people listen. To it. That's kind of how we started. Like we was finding our way in. Like when we started World War One, uh, we, we kind of started out with ideas and how the show was going to function. We're still terrible at listen to our show who are we kidding <laughs> well yeah but we i look at the numbers day to day trust me but but when we start when we started off we were just getting things together because like uh adrian our other friend who does the podcast like larry and adrian never did a podcast but we will always talk on skype and just like like you know just talk crap or just talk random stuff and we would be like we needed to record this so when we started i'm using my expertise then be like okay this is kind of how we should do it hosting and we never had a plan we would sometimes talk about the news and then later on we were just like you know what we are a train wreck of professionalism because we'll just talk about one thing have a whole show plan and then speak about a whole bunch of other stuff and just straight far out and laugh and yeah and, and that's kind of like the, almost the fun episodes when you when you don't have nothing planned and you just really just talking about stuff because this weird discussions come out of it and just having a fun good time just be like we actually did a forty five the hour show and didn't even realize that we recorded it like like oh. that we planned it out yeah I, and I I I personally need like some kind of some kind of something to cling to, something to come back to, some huh. form in it because I, I this is a, a genetic thing. I'm convinced because everyone, my mother, I was just talking to my mother today for Mother's Day because we're recording this on Mother's Day, and I called my mother because I'm a good boy, oh. and uh, she was telling she was saying to me that she talked to her sister on the phone for five hours the other day. Whoa. Five hours. How do you do that? Like my mom and I can go for can can go for two, and we you know we talk once a week, on average two good hours. And I don't even know what the hell like we, we talk about TV shows we're watching and uh-huh. and and the stuff we're doing, whatever idiotic craps going on in politics. And, oh goodness. You know, some some silly thing that my father did because he was lucid for like thirty seconds, and and you know just. But and and somehow two hours passes, <clears throat> five. Oh, you was talking. I, I was like, "How did you?" She's like, "Oh, I don't know. I cooked dinner. She cooked dinner. <laughs> we what? just kept talking. <clears throat> Neither of us were really aware of it. And so, like, I know that it's possible for me to just sort of meander on and on and on and digress and and branch off and and just sort of chat nonstop. But then. Sometimes I feel like, like if I'm doing it for a show, uh huh, I really should be more focused than that, shouldn't I? I don't know. We never are. Well, <laughs> good for you. Good for you. Because that was the thing. That's, we sometimes like, are, but it's a rare occasion. Yes. Like, cause when we when we would do Pod Toy, I would just be lost. Dismal gestures. Too, I would just be. I was along for the freaking ride, and. And that was okay. Like I could do that, but there wasn't there wasn't a whole lot of expectation placed upon me either, right? I right. didn't have to remain focused because it was gonna it was meant to go off the rails. No, but you you served almost a dedicated purpose in Pod Toy. You were the person that took Sterling's insanity and then subverted it into something just intentionally sinister. It went from batshit insane to sinister with about three sentences out of your mouth. I, that is a, that is a gift. Um, (laughs) I, I have, I have a, a talent for being able to find the best and the worst in a situation. Um, and and presented with the opportunity, because I, and I don't know if it's just like the Boy Scouts drilled that into me. And I know it seems weird, but no, it's like that be prepared thing. Yeah. But it's also a bit of a defense mechanism, too, in a lot of ways. 
Hmm. Uh, That's interesting. It's, it's as bad as this is. Oh my god, it could be so much worse, right? Let's explore that. Oh, wow. Like it could be really bad, guys. It could be really bad. This what we got going on right here? Oh, that's fine. We're we're all <laughs> Nobody's in 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 outrageous pain yet. Could be. Let's well. explore that. <laughs> Like you, you had an ability to take Jonathan Holmes, and I'm I'm gonna loosely quote Sterling, Jonathan Holmes's whinging ring piece from just having a bullseye painted on it to getting it listed on the FBI's most wanted list. Uh, yeah, I I felt a little like the whole embargo that we had to enforce. Uh, because we took that too far. I I'm feel. actually listening right about in the middle of that embargo now. We took that too far, and 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 you know, and it was it would have been one thing if it had just been something for us between us, but it was something again for an audience. Mm-hmm. And you know, it, it's you can't control what your audience does, right? I say they latched onto that hard. And but and that's but that's the excuse that you always hear from people who have things done in their name is that, well, I can't control what my audience does, but you can control what inspires them to do it. Right. That is true. Yes. And so, I mean, that was really the whole purpose of that embargo was to say, okay, you know what, if we keep doing this. This is only going to encourage them to do more, and it needs to stop. And uh, gosh, I wish, I wish some other people with very large audiences could do that. P- people with with like, oh, I don't know, talk radio programs mm-hmm. could just say, hey, you know, maybe chill, <laughs> <laughs> maybe. Maybe what I'm doing isn't healthy for this country. <laughs> oh, talk radio. Uh, wait, I'm the, sorry, I didn't mean to bring it down. That's another habit I have. No, talk, uh, no, no, no. You're you're okay, actually. Eddie and I, last time he was in town a couple weeks ago, uh, spent some time talking politics and assorted pieces of talk radio yeah. at that. Actually, so because the the same stuff that's going now with. Uh, the administration i'm just like this this is going to be a book to read or this is going to be a movie to watch like oh i can't i can't wait for the movie oh i cannot wait for the movie i'm so excited for the movie because then it will all be over with the movies out it's all over like uh, that's what i'm looking forward to i'm looking forward to the movie because that means that this shit has passed oh goodness uh it yeah you know, i I'm tired. I'm, I'm tired all the time. And and my life's not that different from what it was a year ago, except, well, there's this one thing that's just really dramatically <laughs> different that I can see. And, uh, yeah, it's just, it's exhausting. Uh, the and, and, and this, I don't know, this is probably not the show to talk about politics. So, oh, I mean, it, the show is open to anything. It's a video game. Every, okay. Uh, I, I, that, I, but... I don't want to get too, I don't want to get too into it. It's just one of those deals where like, I, I cannot deal with how much happens in such sh- short spans of time. There... And it has this like lengthening effect on time. I really feel like. 2018 should be going on already yes. with yeah you know, everything that's happened in just the last four and a half months it, it, it it's all it's just been a wait what just happened wait what did he say wait what are they show it, it's just been that for the past few months right and i'm just now and it should be great for the video game industry it pretty much is because <laughs> we all i mean we have all, like for the last four months we have had great games come out across all platforms even pc yeah it's been a really really solid few months and thank god something yes. else to do other things to to distract us uh, and i uh, well i don't know maybe that's 
maybe that's part of the problem. Maybe we've had too many things to distract us. I, I, I don't, I don't know. Where, I, I mean, if I need self care though, and damn it, that's how I achieve it. So, well, it, it feels like like politics now feels like a scripted comedy that should be have a laugh track to it. And video games is just like the savior or our rescue. And that's how it, that's literally how it feels. Like, like, I, some, some stuff that's going on in politics, I just can't watch. You know what? Let me put on Bayonetta 2, cause I feel like being up some demons, cause I'm kind of upset watching this. Like, it, it's been kind of that kind of feel. You talk about, I mean, like, comedy writing, comedy writers could not script this. Yes. Like, it's, it, it's so beyond them. Now, here you have, Donald Trump firing James Comey on a Tuesday. Like, what the hell are you thinking? Firing him on a Tuesday. That's a Friday deal if I've ever heard one. But fine, you fire him on a Tuesday. And then a Wednesday, you you, you sit down with Henry Kissinger of all fucking people. Like, I mean, and then you follow it up with two Russian officials. It did get mad because they post they posted up uh, photos of you speaking to him. Duh, you you had the Russian media come in and take pictures with that meeting. What you expected no, yeah, to was, do? Well, I mean, they were going to post. Someone was going to post photos of the of the meeting. That was you just you only supplied them with one source of them. You wouldn't let U.S. press into the room. And for what reason? Like there's there's no reason that I can think of other than he didn't want embarrassing questions in that room said in English where microphones could hear them and they could be broadcast via radio and television waves. But then you throw but then you throw all of that I on Twitter. That, but I've I've learned I generally keep my mouth out of politics in uh in any kind of large form unless I am like face to face with an individual and can talk to somebody. I, I don't think Twitter means means shit politically, honestly. I, I really don't. I know. But uh, it's just it's, it's just so it's weird. A, it's it's a place for us to go and be I mean I'm as guilty of it as anybody. It's it's not like um you know, I'm 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 saying, Oh, don't do this. You know, but it's it's it is a place for us to all vent our righteous indignation at whatever's happening and is there you know to serve as a, a soothing balm for our rage uh so that we can all commiserate together in our agony but it's not uh doing anything it, it's it's not I, mean, I it's informative i get lots of information from it yeah. um and that helps to inform discussions that i'll have with other people but you know, there's no, the, it's not a myth that bubbles exist and that, you know, like I look at my timeline and it's all the same shit. It's all the same shit. Shit I agree with for the most part. Uh, there's a few people in there that I, I, I disagree with um, either by a philosophy or by methods. Um, usually if I don't agree with their methods, I at least agree with their philosophy. And if I don't agree with their philosophy, I at least like their methods somewhat. You know, there's something about – but usually you got to have one of those. And that's – on the one hand, it's not exposing me to alternative vo- points of view uh, as effectively as maybe it could be. On the other hand, my experience with the points of view which differ from my own on that platform do not – reflect the sort of people I want to engage with or have any expectation of having an impact on. So what's the point? Well, I read your Twitter for the comedy because the comedy is so spot on. Like, I would literally be like, yeah. It's there for jokes. It's there for jokes. It's there for good times. Um, (laughs) You and your wife. (laughs) I was just like, I I know she got to be throwing some shade. Because sometimes... it was something that you posted recently about her, and it was just like, oh, she got to be upset about this. <laughs> I I clear those with her. I do I do make sure I I I make sure she's okay uh-huh. with any of the things that I I would I would put on there before I post them because, um, yeah, I <laughs> I tease her pretty mercilessly, 
and she deserves every bit of it, but she's uh, also unbelievably patient and nice and um and and sometimes she has a habit of like walking into expressions that she's, she doesn't realize that the things that she's saying, you know, it's it's phrasing. It's the phrasing joke and I get to I get a little a lot of play out of that. And then, you know, I do I like I like it when she makes me look stupid more more than anything. Oh, wow. uh, she doesn't have doesn't doesn't happen often enough. Uh, I you know not to brag, but I am the one who's right most of the time. Oh wow, <laughs> but it, it it is funny. I just have to give give it that um, just to say that because, like I said earlier, your comedy is so spot on. I I think you are like probably one of the most funniest people on Twitter. That That's I like really, to read. Yeah, really, I really. I there me, you to say. I, I, I don't. I don't think it's true. Uh, <laughs> well, because because like, it's because I think reading your Twitter and just reading the jokes that you put out there, it just kind of like brightens up my day. Like reading other people's Twitter, well, like it, it's gonna be funny. But your 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 tweets are just like funny and it kind of brightens my day and I, just, and I look kind of look forward to you saying something just be like I want to see what he reacts I want to see what he's going to say because whatever he does it's going to be hilarious well I you know that's I, 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 I'm glad that uh, that that makes me happy because I I am legitimately trying to be funny <laughs> and uh and 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 trying to make observations at the same time, and I hate that expression, observational humor, because then I think of Jerry Seinfeld, and but I mean I guess that's also a lot of what I grew up on too, like the the comedians that I, I was sort of raised on Carlin, um, and and later Carlin, you know, this wasn't hippy dippy weatherman and some of his. Uh, you know, his, his sort of radio style broadcast humor, and 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 that when he got really sort of acerbic and 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 cranky, but still he was a he was a wordsmith, and that always attracted me. He he loved language a lot, and and would play with it, and that's so that's a uh, a big draw for me is to be able to play with language and and what it means and interpretations and and uh and puns i love puns oh god they're you know you know who has a much funnier twitter feed than i do if you like puns oh i do and and i and i realize it's not they're not for everybody but if you like puns boy you should be following holly green at winners use drugs uh, she's a another games writer. Writes for uh, she's an editor at, at, at Paste now. I think if I'm if I'm remembering correctly, I should be so mad at me if I got that wrong. But um, God, she she said something the other day. It was um, if if people uh, do people with diamonds on the soles of their shoes leave a carbon footprint. <laughs> wow I love that girl <laughs> that just that's and all, all the all the time she drops these and I'm so angry that she got to them before I had the thought like she's just she's hilarious um but no twitter's twitter's a great place for comedy in general I think that the, like the people that I follow who aren't games people and a lot of that is you know i mean i would probably follow games people if i hadn't had like a professional journalistic purpose for using twitter Mm -hmm. um i I probably would have found a lot of following a lot of games like maybe not to the proportion that i do but i mean outside of games people the people i follow are, are comedians um I follow a lot of the members of the stand up or not not stand up the sketch group the state who are now everywhere everywhere um that was a show that I I grew up on and a lot of my sort of uh uh tendency towards subversion uh, was really inspired in a lot of ways by the work of that show and um and later uh, Viva Variety 
uh, which they did in Reno 911, which was also out of that group of people. But um, oh, I love Reno 911. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Reno's great. Reno's phenomenal. Uh, Lennon and Garant. Uh, well, I mean, like Tom Lennon and Ben Garant are two of like the most successful screenwriters in Hollywood. Yeah. The the guys who made Reno 911, right? Like, think about that for a second. That little cheap, uh, you know, like nickel and dime production. Um, and, you know, but neither the museum and Herbie fully loaded, which, you know, laugh, but it made bank. Like, they, they do really great work. And then you have some of the other people uh, from, from the state, like um, Michael Ian Black, um, Michael Show, Walter David Wayne, they went on and created Stella together. David Wayne uh, directs and, and produces all sorts of stuff. Uh, you know, they had Wet Hot American Summer that got everybody back together. Um, and uh, Ken Marino's doing these sort of uh, – he, he just had one come out, How to Be a Latin Lover. I haven't seen it yet, but I'm really interested in that. He's been writing and directing things. Uh, and then you have someone like Kevin Allison who – uh, is like one of the best podcasters out there. Right? And these people, it's the, uh, 11 of them, I think, they've infiltrated entertainment at all of these different levels, in television and film, in podcasting, in, in all of these different places, uh, stand-up, improv, theater, and they just did shit. And that's what I... I wind up following them on Twitter because they're all just really fucking smart, funny people. I don't, I didn't really have anywhere I was going with this. I just got, I get excited <laughs> about the state. Here, let, let, let me uh, wrangle it into something uh, cohesive for the show. Yeah, that's a good idea because I feel like we've been going for a really long time and I've just been doing all the work. <laughs> like, honestly, I think most of the video game related stuff that we had was before we started recording. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but in any case, uh, bringing comedy into it, um, what are some of your favorite games in terms of that delivered a focus on comedy? Oh, uh, I mean, comedy in games is not, it's not that prevalent, right? There aren't that many games that we think of as comedy games. Uh, and I know that some of them are like, there's been some recent moves in that jazz punk uh, a few years back. As I recall, I didn't play it. I didn't, I didn't get to it. So like the, the games that I think of as comical are, are like LucasArts Adventures back in the day. Um, the original Maniac Mansion cracks me up. I was just talking about um, on the spinoff Doctors, I think it was. There was some uh, – it was the Ratchet and Clank episode. We were talking about Ratchet and Clank. There's a joke early on about – uh, somebody's mother getting called and them hearing these sort of grunting noises and thinking it's an obscene phone caller. And, you know, this is a movie that came out last year. That Does that still happen? I don't think that still happens. I, I think that that, like, died with landlines, didn't it? You know, it starts, when Star 69 became available, the obscene phone caller uh, thing really tailed off. So I was like, you have to really have a certain age to get this joke. Or... Be a kid that played Maniac Mansion because that joke's in Maniac Mansion. Uh, they it, it it's it's brilliant. There's a, one of the puzzles requires you to distract Nurse Edna, and you find her phone number in the house and dial it from another phone in the house. None of the characters in Maniac Mansion have dialogue or the 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 playable characters. Uh -huh. They don't speak after. The game starts at the very beginning of the game. They all have a little dialogue exchange that sets up why they're there. And then they never say another word the rest of the game because there's no talk to command in it. And so you use the phone and you're just silent on the other end. And she thinks it's an obscene caller. And once you, you know, and, 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 is, and is down for it, like she's she's all ready to go. Uh, she's, she's very interested in what you, what you're selling. <laughs> and, uh, so yeah, there's, uh, a lot, a lot of LucasArts, the, the monkey, I monkey Island was a great series focused on comedy and, um, See, I, I wonder I should I play times, that one? I've never played uh, Secret of Monkey Island. I know the remaster is out on PS4, but I haven't played it. So 
uh do you recommend recommend me playing if I want some good comedy? I should say. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Secret of Monkey Island is a a very funny game. Uh, and and I is so you know so it it's an early LucasArts game and so there's some like weird puzzle oddities like you know, like, okay, that's some sort of strange logic that you've chosen to use to accomplish this goal, but whatever. Okay, fine. You've got a chicken with a bully in it. You know, but um, but no, that's a really solid game. Uh, I also I liked I mean, I grew up on Infocom games to no small extent, too. Because, like, the first computer I had was a Commodore 64, and you know, I mean, first computer that was mine. And uh, I had a bunch of the Zork games and, um, you know, and, and I later got a big box set of like all the Infocom games uh, once I got a, a proper PC. And so I, I played a lot of those. Zork had a an undercurrent of humor running throughout it that was uh, very strong. Uh, one of the, you know, again, talking about comedy and wordplay, there's a, if you can track it down, and I, I think... Activision has done this or does this from time to time. They just make old Infocom games available because they have them and they're there. And, and I think they did make this available at one point in like a web-based interface. It's called Nord and Bert couldn't make heads nor tails of it. It's a text adventure oh. that's based on wordplay. And you have all of these different, like, they're like little mini stories that you go into and you experience or what, I mean, as much as you do, but like one of them is a uh, jack of all trades. And you have this box that has all of these little protrusions sticking out of it. Mm -hmm. And each, you know, it's like there's a little fluffy tail or there's a, uh, a power switch or you know, whatever. And you flip the switch, it turns into a jackhammer. And uh, you turn the crank and it turns to a jack in the box. And so you have to figure out all of the different jacks to solve the assorted puzzles in the game. The problem is one of them, the little fluffy tail, and it's why it's so firm in my memory, is if you pull that, it turns into a jackrabbit and it runs away. <laughs> you have to start all over. Oh, wow. I know, uh, I know for me, games like Phoenix Wright... Uh, Bowser oh, Inside sure. Story, like um, Fire Emblem Awakening, is one character who she's she's very like brave and very bold, and you know there was one part where she told one of the characters that she'll put her foot through him if he if he keeps like keep, uh, keep on hitting her, hitting on her, and it's literally funny. And I kind of think that I, I love when it's like video games throw in some of that comedy stuff to it. Like, oh, I, yeah. I like I busted out laughing when I'm when I in, inside story, uh, when I'm Bowser and then I see a Goomba with a big lollipop made out, made out of a peppermint. And I'm like, <laughs> what the world? And then you can suck it up. You suck out the peppermint and the Goomba, this big Goomba runs off crying. And I'm just, I'm on the floor dying. I'm just like, this might be a kid's game, but this is kind of hilarious for adults. And I, I, I like that kind of comedy in games. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's that's fun. Well, and like, well, I don't know why. Portal. I mean, there, there's a great example oh. of modern comedy writing yes, yes. in games. Yes. We actually had a companion cube wedding cake. Oh, that's fun. Yes. <laughs> that's fun. Yeah. I'll have Portal. to have my wife send you pictures so you can see it. Yeah, you should do that. That that. That'd be great. No, it's yeah, dude, get that's on that. sharp, and 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 it was, and it really came out of nowhere. And that's the other thing about, I think, comedy games that is challenging for people is that you kind of have to be surprised to some extent by comedy, right? Uh -huh. And I, that that doesn't necessarily always lend itself well to like replayability. And I think we sort of encourage replayability in our games now more there's a more of an emphasis on that because I, people need to get the impression that they're getting a lot of value or they need to be huge in scope and comedy doesn't necessarily work on a long timeline uh unless that's the joke like if your joke is that you are posting a podcast that consists of three mimes 
having a conversation about the crisis in Syria. That's a 30 minute joke. You have to commit to the full 30 minutes. You can't cop out, right? You can't just do, ha ha, I did it for two minutes and that's, no, you need a full 30 minutes of silence to justify the existence of that joke. You got to push that level of awkward to it's very extreme. Right. Yeah. And, and that, I mean, that's, that, that is sort of like the, what the anti humor movement in comedy, the, the Tim and Eric kind of, uh, uh, shift in the landscape that that's happened, which I'm not that into personally. In the same boat. I, I can't stand Tim and Eric. Like I like awkward humor, but that pushes to the point of this is now just dumb. Well, it's like, yeah, it, it, it tries. It feels like it's trying really hard. And I think that, that, that a lot of the joy that comes out of awkward humor, at least for me, is when it feels natural. When mm-hmm. it, it this yeah, this character is just this way, and they don't think anything of it, or it's it's a, a part of the fabric of who they are. Um, and so, needlessly dragging out, staring at the camera, fourth wall breaking. Hey, this is the joke, guys. Um, I don't know. It doesn't, doesn't to each their own. I know. And it, it's not to say that I don't like things Tim and Eric have done either. I, I thought Tom goes to the mayor was brilliant. Like brilliant. I, I, I get what Bob Odenkirk sees in those guys. Um, I just don't want to watch it. Yeah. Well, I, understand. I, I was going to say, um, throwing back to, uh, you know, some of the old point and click adventure stuff. One of my favorite instances of comedy and games was uh, the Neverhood because it just it had such a strange sense of humor about it. Mm-hmm. Well, that's one that I, I missed actually. I, I know we had uh, um, two of the the people behind that on Sup Holmes at, at one point, and I, but that was like the the claymation styled. Yes, yep. is that it? Yep. Um, and then uh, they recently put out Armacrog, which actually. Um, I'm waiting on a text back from them here, but uh, we've been talking to them about having them on the show here in coming weeks. So, but uh, Neverhood was one that I grew up with. That was one that came in that suite of games, you know, with your very first PC, and then in a very strange departure, you know, they followed that up with a direct sequel that was an entirely different type of game, and they did Skull Monkeys, which was a tough as nails platformer instead, but still mm-hmm. had that great sense of humor to it. Yeah, I somehow missed out on both of those. Like, I remember marketing for Neverhood. Like, the the name sticks out. And I know it had, like, some, a pretty, pretty distinctive visual style. Uh, but I I didn't, yeah, I never played it. Somehow it just completely passed me by. Uh, lots of things passed me by now. Like, I... It's, it's one that's worth revisiting. Yeah. All right, all right. I'll, I'll give it a look. I can do that. Um, Game Informer... Did a eight player smash, and their the, the commentary from there is was very comedic. Do you think, uh, um, when well, we're not game informer, do you think when people do commentary over video games, do you think when it's funny, it's just like okay, they got a good thing going on, can they keep this going on? Well, it, I mean, I don't even know how to answer that like i so first of all um it's it's and this is just like a personal thing i don't i don't watch a lot of let's play Mm -hmm. um i don't uh i i do like watching because like you you talk about commentating i like watching competitive um video games and hearing commentary over that and that's mostly because um, well, one, I, I kind of like seeing how that has evolved, the, the act of commentating over video games as sport. Um, I think it's really interesting. It's been fascinating to watch develop as a, a thing that you have. I mean, you have to be good at it. It is a skill mm-hmm. to be able to commentate over a fighting game or, or, or any competitive game for them out of your league or whatever. And, and I like it in, you know, for games like League things because I don't play – League of Legends or really MOBAs in general. And so uh, I don't necessarily know all the ins and outs of strategy. Uh, I, that game is simple enough 
that you can look at the mini map and get a general idea of who's winning, but to understand what's happening and the close up combat, I need someone to explain that shit to me. And uh, so I, I'm into that, but in terms of people talking over gameplay footage, just, you know, to, I mean, that, that could be a podcast and that's fine. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, but I would wind up minimizing the window and just listening to them talk if they were engaging people that I was interested in hearing talk. Uh, I, I don't have a tendency to like the, the MST3K riffing on things uh, and uh, maybe I'm just old, but like talking over movies pisses me off. Like drives me crazy. My wife uh, can't help herself, and, and and that's fine. You know, it's like I, I understand it. She gets excited about whatever's happening on the screen, and, and I deal with it. But on the whole, I, I, I never saw the appeal. And, like, I do get it. Like, they're funny people. Like, I, I just watched the MST3K revival uh, with my wife, and I enjoyed it. But I would not – I don't opt to – the thing that I'm watching should be entertaining enough on its own without your help. And if it's not, then why am I watching it? I guess is, is, is where I sort of come from, from that perspective. That and I'm, I'd rather play the video games myself than watch someone else play them. Uh, they're practical. Like there, I see practical considerations for why this genre has like exploded into uh, such success. I mean, just from the standpoint of, I think a large part, part of the audience are, are kids who, you know, can't afford all the games or don't have or have limited access to games and are interested in games. And Lord knows if I'd been a kid now, like if I were 12 years old now, I would totally be all over YouTube watching other people play video games because I have no money. I have, you know, like a console, maybe uh, I have you know, just very, very limited access to the content. Uh, and so if, Viewed from that lens, I see why the entertainment medium has appeal. Mm -hmm. uh, but I've, I've even, I've done it. I like, I've made these videos, and yeah, because you was doing them like on Saturday mornings for destruction. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I have, I have no problem with squaring the idea of making content that I would never watch myself. Um. You know, I try to you know, try to make something entertaining. Uh, certainly when we do Saturday morning hangover with Jordan and and my wife, Katrina, it was, you know, it was always about trying to bring something to whatever the content was. And there was a format and uh, you know, we, had, we had a plan, but I, I would never have watched it. I, I I like to think we were likable people and that I would have liked to have watched all three of us do something else. <laughs> right. <laughs> but I probably, I, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have watched that. And I, and I tried to make something that was more like something I would watch. Like it had segments and an order to it. And uh, I have, I, I've always had this sort of weird, weird need to professionalize in some respect, this sort of digital stuff that we're making, this cruft that we're all sort of manufacturing at pace. And, and I, I maybe to some extent thought it would help make it stand out more. Uh -huh. um, I, I did a podcast way back in like 2009, I want to say, called Bit Transmission. And it was deliberately designed to be produced with segments and you know casual conversations but on deeper topics and and it was i i built it to sound like an npr show and the best compliment i ever got about that was that it sounded like an npr show about video games so i achieved my goal right and and I thought podcasts should all sound like NPR productions. And then NPR had successful podcasts. And now all the podcasts start to sound like NPR productions. And and that's great. Like, I'm so glad it's gotten there. 
Like there's so, there's so much podcast content that I now want to listen to that I never would have listened to podcasts before. Uh, like, have you guys heard S Town? You, I've uh, I, I've heard people mention it, but I haven't listened to it yet. Oh my god, it's so good! It's so good. Like, cereal is one of the best things that's ever happened to podcasts because now everyone's trying to make shit like cereal, and a lot of it is really good. Um, so yeah, I. I don't know. I've just I've actually just started getting into podcasts as something to listen to as opposed to something to make. Um, really? I, I listen to. Yeah, I, I just started listening to uh, my brother, my brother and me. Like, in the last two months. Wow. I've been listening to uh, How Did This Get Made when they're uh, like discussing about bad movies. Uh, oh, sure. Yeah. Like... yeah I'm, I, I read the companion articles that are that go with that. Uh, oh, Harris, yeah. Who... Yeah, for um, console wars. Yeah, Blake Harris. Uh, he yeah, does, yeah, he does companion pieces uh, to that podcast that I've I've read many of, uh, but I don't know that I've ever listened to an episode of it. But that's yes, that's one I'd I'd like to, I'd like to listen to. Yeah, they uh, 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 they did Street Fighter and they did Mortal Kombat. Uh, <laughs> huh. Yeah, yeah, those are. Oh, I love Street Fighter. I think Street Fighter's a little. Actually, the first Mortal Kombat's not bad. Yeah, I like the first Mortal Kombat. The the second Mortal Kombat comes all the way back around. Though. Oh, that um, was a it, tragedy! You know, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful mess. Uh, I would refer you to the uh, episode of the spinoff Doctors on Mortal Kombat Annihilation. Now, Jim and I have both decided it's our new like favorite bad movie uh, in terms of being the bad movie that we think everyone has to watch because it is just it's astounding. It's a really it's it it's a just a beautiful mess. I really love that. Oh wow. I was say one of my wife's favorite things is to go back and rewatch some of the old uh video game movies with the old pod toy commentaries to which uh one of those was actually my fault and I, I'm the one who was responsible for breaking that for quite a while because I'm the one that pushed the uh, double dragon one. Oh, oh, that yeah! Really, my fault. Uh, we did it. Well, Jim and I did that for spinoff doctors. Oh, oh, not that long ago too. And, you know, that's a movie that has a lot of great ideas, and like the the practical, the, the emphasis on practical effects, and the like the the sort of war torn city and the cars. There's like there, there was a, that was a movie with someone who had a vision of a movie, but not Double Dragon, really. <laughs> like. Like the execution was just it wasn't just there. Oh no, it's it's trash. Like, but it, but there's there was love in it as well. Like, it, I see a lot of these mo- movies based on video games where there's just like, like there's no love in it. There's no affection, and maybe they didn't like hit the mark mm-hmm. with Double Dragon, but damned if they weren't trying. And and that goes a long way. Uh, we have a. Uh, a thing we, we call the Kingsley effect because Ben Kingsley will do any fucking movie for a paycheck. Yes. But delivers, he delivers no effort whatsoever. <laughs> like, none. He's just like, I'm Ben Kingsley. Thank you for my check. Uh, and by contrast, you have Billy Zane who is like magnetic in everything he does. Like <sighs> you cannot. And, and, and then you have blood rain and they're both in it. I have a same blood rain. Oh God. <laughs> See, I'm I'm still convinced though that Double Dragon was a masterpiece for the fact that it got uh, Vanna White and Andy Dick on the screen at the same time. Yeah, that was a little strange. Uh, I'm still tripping about the station wagon. I'm like, wait, what? Yep. Yeah. No, that that movie is really amazing. I mean, the gang <laughs> in their overalls and. Oh, come right. on. Yeah. That was so bizarre. Was 90s. Oh, it's 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 a wonderful film. Uh the, I I of the the like many bad video game movies. I, I don't know. I uh, the House of the Dead one is just pure garbage. Uh, that yeah. one I was just like 
wait, this this editing is all crap, kind of crazy. And then he was he didn't uh he introduced um like clips from the video game and they were like from different yep. parts of House of the Dead games. I'm like, wait, you just show one now two is on, but you're not back. It, that was just literally insane. Cameo appearance by Biff Naked. <laughs> oh wow! Yes. Oh goodness. Yep. Yep. No, yeah, I'm actually I'm gonna watch the sequel um, this week. They did a sequel. When did they do a sequel. Uh, I don't know. A couple years later, Bull didn't direct this one. He he. I think he produced. Okay, Uwe Bull. His the name of the king I seen. I don't know how I I don't know how I survived that one. That oh that one was. That one was fun, actually, because, like, you look at the cast that he got for it, and it's just kind of kind of crazy. But it's, you know, like, Uva Bowl is such a, what's the word? I, like, I want to say terrible, but it doesn't really do it justice. He is, like, a black hole of talent. Like, he somehow managed to make a movie where, like, Ron Perlman isn't interesting. Oh yeah! Oh goodness! Uh, he's he's terrible in it, uh, but you know you got Jason Statham in that. Um, who, who else? There's there's someone else like really noted. Oh, Burt Reynolds. That one. The how how did this get made? They did that episode too, and it was just like Burt Reynolds was in it. Like I forgot, I forgot majority of that movie because. It was so far fetched and it was just so insane. I'm like, oh my goodness. And Matthew Lillard's in it. And being Matthew Lillard. Yes. <laughs> like nineties flip it Matthew Lillard, but you know, in a medieval setting. So The Wizard he gets to be bratty. The Wizard is still my favorite. I love that movie to the end of time. I don't care what anyone says. I love The Wizard. It's, it's, well, yeah, I, I I saw it in theaters when it came out, mm -hmm. and like I mean, Nintendo was life <laughs> at that at that time. And yeah, it's I think it's impossible not for people of a you know a certain age or era to not have some sort of fond association. And even knowing that it's an I mean it's a ninety minute commercial and not a particularly good one. Like, it is no. But no. as a as a kid, I like when I went to go see it. I definitely went to go see the video games, like like Double Dragon and Ninja Turtles, and like I want to see all of this. Like I like, wasn't okay, thinking I mean, of it. Like when I say Nintendo not party. a good commercial, I mean not particularly entertaining. Yes, as effective as a commercial, certainly because we all sat for you know seventy five minutes of the ninety minute feature. To see, you know, two and a half minutes of Super Mario Brothers three. So it worked, but the movie's not good. It's it, it, it video Armageddon is good, like and 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 really it's it's the I think the feeling that video Armageddon as an idea makes us have. Uh huh. Uh, that scene is really good. The whole. Fred Savage and his little brother hitchhiking across the United States while being chased by two inept private detectives and an equally inept older brother and father. But just... Ugh. <laughs> uh, did you see the Assassin's I mean, Creed movie? You know what? If you could... Here, here, all right. Okay. If, the movie I would want is Pee-wee's Big Adventure that ends with video Armageddon. Give me that movie. <laughs> oh Pee-wee's Big Adventure. Fucking great. And they both can have, you can have the dinosaur, you know, thing. Yes. In both. Just like have, have Pee-wee Herman in, instead of his bike getting stolen or no, his bike gets stolen by the, yeah, there you go. His bike gets stolen by the freaking wizard and he's chasing him across the country to get it back and they wind up with video Armageddon. <laughs> I will watch this. I will watch this. Well, that's our here's the pitch. 
Oh, God. I will watch that. Oh, my goodness. So normally what we run for here is the pitch, but I'll take it. <laughs> oh, oh, my goodness. Uh. So um, just to kind of shift a little bit here, uh, we've all talked about it on this show, but as someone who's spent many years, you know, covering it uh, professionally in the industry, what are you anticipating or expecting to come out of E3, at least from the big three this year? Uh, I think there's going to be some video game announcements. They're going to announce some video games. <laughs> <laughs> Shit, well, I mean, breaking news, industry-shattering predictions. You know, this is like, okay, so Microsoft's going to have the Scorpio there. And what? I, NAC 2? Yeah. You know, but I think Microsoft. Your take on this, because I don't think Scorpio is nearly as big of a thing as, or it's going to be nearly as big of a thing as they want it to be. But that's that's my look on it. I'm um, curious to see what you think. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. I I, I don't have. How I think I think a large part of it is that people have to be able to see perceived value in the new hardware. And I don't have a 4K TV. So I don't know what Scorpio is going to do for me. Right? It's the same with the PS4 Pro. Um, and I, yeah, I, I don't know that it's necessary. I don't see a whole lot of like reason for me to, to cough up and buy one. I haven't bought an Xbox One yet. So, like, if I'm going to buy a new console, maybe I will just buy the Scorpio because that's the new xbox console but it's it's weird to me that uh, to to some extent that we're doing this sort of stopgap you know incremental upgrade thing and it's i mean consoles have been working towards resembling pcs more and more over time and so the the ability of a pc to make sort of iterative jumps within one device just by changing out some hardware um, makes them more flexible for upgrading and and this this like this is the equivalent of getting a little upgrade to your existing hardware but you're buying a whole other console for it so it doesn't really work in the same way yeah. and and like okay backwards compatible compatibility on everything which is fine but a, like, almost nobody uses that. I don't know if you know that. Hardly anybody uses backwards compatibility. I do when I can. Do you? Actually, yeah. Do you I, I actually do. I, do you? Mm -hmm. Not going to lie, at least the two of us do on a fair, fairly frequent basis. Yeah, it's, it, I think it is a feature that is uh, it's used by, like, single-digit percentages of yeah. users. And... So that's not a huge draw from the sense of, oh, well, I'll sell my old console and still play. Old. But because the distance between them is too sh is so short, uh -huh. I guess that's not, you know, a thing. I, I, I don't know what to think about it. Well, I, I, I don't know what their goals are, even if it's just to have shorter console life cycles. Well, is I that know, it? I know with the, with the backwards um the, uh, with the BC, it's like for me, I invest a lot in past games, and if sure. I could play it on that current system, I, that money close to, like if my game library is almost about twelve hundred some dollars, I just don't want to give that up. And I, but you know, if I yeah. could move that content to the new, the like the new system, and you know, so and maybe revisit it sometime down the line if I want to write a story or a blog about it or just discuss it. You know, that availability at least is there. Right. Um, it's it's not like the appeal is lost on me, right? Uh -huh. Um Yeah, although although if I'm like the consoles also get wind up pretty small by the time like they're at the end of their life cycle. Yes. Like you look at how tiny the PS two slim is. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh so like that my my thinking on that is always well if I want to have access to that software, I'm probably going to want access to the hardware that it was specifically designed to run on. And so I wind up keeping all my consoles. 
you know and Me i'll too. like after after the tail end of the life cycle is is dead and gone you know and the next thing is there and i could pick up uh, a a new version of the last generation of the console i'll do that and then i have that forever and i can always hook it up and and use that software so like the backwards compatibility it's, not, it's a convenient feature certainly but i was prepared for the eventuality that you know i was going to run this stuff on on its dedicated hardware so it's and you know not everyone's a pack rat and certainly you don't want to have to go hooking up and unhooking stuff all the time it's a lifestyle choice i understand i know with the one it was good for me because with, with the past 360 which is all those systems break in and like almost it felt like every yeah. six months they would kept out come out with a new one and that chip would fill them i was just like you know what i don't even want to deal with that generation for that that system now that you know some of the games are backwards on xbox one like lost odyssey and blue dragon i'm like these were probably the only two games that i want for that system now that i could play them on my current system i'm kind of good to go like I, I, I mean, didn't really lose anything out on it. Where like my Nintendo stuff, if I could use BC on Nintendo stuff, I'm good to go. Like that's all that one that really matters. Sony, not so much, but my Nintendo stuff, yeah. It backwards compatibility oh, is like PS2 big for me. is like the best library ever. It's definitely massive. It's like, got it a has, lot it, of good stuff in it. Oh it's my god, phenomenal and. You'd be surprised how much of it emulates well. Like, really well. <laughs> well like, everybody was all excited that, you know, Dark Cloud and Dark Cloud 2 were going to PS4 in 1080p, you know, uh, up-res textures. And I'm like, okay, you know, I've been emulating that shit off of PS2 <laughs> just for, like, years. Right? And, and let me tell you something. That shit is hot. It looks so good in 1080p. Oh wow, it's so good! Oh man, if you haven't played Dark Cloud two, I played the first one and I did not enjoy it. I thought this was the most orangiest gay. I'm like, I don't know what the world I'm. It's because your fucking weapons break. Yes, <laughs> yeah, it's that Breath of the Wild shit. Hey, but at least Breath of the Wild, you know, supplies you with something else to use. No, I get you. Yes. I get you. Dark Cloud two gets rid of that problem. Now, when's we now when weapons break, they just don't really do damage anymore, and so you go repair them. You still have your weapon; you can keep upgrading it. So okay. it's it's hugely improved, it's and it's got you know a Pokemon Snap like photography invention mini game aspect, and like you want to time taking a photograph of every boss when they're making a specific pose so that uh -huh. you can like unlock new equipment. It's so good. And then there's a golf game you could play on every stage of the procedurally <laughs> generated dungeons. Oh, wow. you clear it of monsters and then you play golf in it. <laughs> wow. Yeah. The, actually the PS2 was like my RPG system. Cause uh, oh, yeah. Final Fantasy Huge for RPGs. Well, I mean <sighs> anything. Anything you wanted, you could find there. Like, 2D platformers. There's a surprising number of really good 2D platformers in the PS2. Yes. Like, it operated in this interesting balance where games were just starting to really look good. But people were still interested in stuff that wasn't dependent on fully rendered 3d characters and you know big ass triple a animations and you know mm -hmm. can you imagine people getting pissed off about facial animations on shit in the ps2 era <laughs> <laughs> yeah never had no never would have happened never would have happened no, uh, they, they would have just been happy if the uh, the mouth movements synced up with the voice right we were damn it <laughs> we marched six feet of snow to that game store uphill both ways came home and it was like watching a godzilla movie and we liked it <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually made eddie play one of those the uh, a couple weeks ago too so yes it, it was at least solid the writing behind it was solid the gameplay behind it was solid it was just one of those, like, like we were talking about earlier, one of those double A, you know, that in between from uh, Crave, you know, 
and the, the production value on the, the visual just didn't quite line up with everything else that was there to go with it. Future tech. Yeah. Is, uh, well, but, okay. So, <laughs> but, but, you know, so we were talking about E3. Yes. Right. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, we're going to Microsoft with a bunch of, so, with a bunch of Scorpio stuff. And there will be some games there. And I, co- I kind of hope they keep the Scorpio name. I, I really enjoy Marcus, uh, the Scorpio. I kind of like that name for it. Yeah, I, I, I don't know what else. I, I don't, I don't care what they call it. It's gonna be dumb, whatever they call it. <laughs> it's gonna be a dumb name. It's gonna be a dumb name that we all make fun of because that's what we do now. I'm thinking right now. I'm calling it. They throw back to one of their other major fuck-ups, and it comes out, and it's the Xbox Milo. Ooh. <laughs> you know I'm going to be looking at Twitter all day long if they say Xbox Milo. Mm-mm. I'm going to be Mm-mm. reading everybody no. who is watching E3. I'm going to be watching everybody's tweets, so I can just be like, mm-hmm. No, Milo's, Milo's dead, gone, and and I'm I'm... That's fine. That connect was such a fucking disappointment. It was. Oh, it was sad. Like, I, mean, I, I, I have no confidence in VR. I'm zero. Zero confidence in VR as a sustainable platform for video games. I think it has lots of other applications. There's, there's going to be all sorts of cool stuff done with it. Uh, but for con- home consumer video games, I just just don't see it but i do believe that the future is in ar i i I really not hololens we ain't there yet Mm -hmm. but that's gonna be where we start to see that kind of technology really take off because i mean you already see it with pokemon snap Mm -hmm. or pokemon go yeah yeah go whatever whatever the yeah whatever it is, the Pokemon game on the phone that I haven't played because I have common sense. <laughs> and, and I know I know my limits. And I know what happened when I installed uh, fucking Fallout Shelter and uh, lost time. Have you ever, you, ever, you ever done that? You just lost time? And then you tell your wife, no, I got abducted by aliens, but you were really, like, playing Fallout Shelter for, like, four days? <laughs> wow. No, uh, it's... Yeah, so I... But yeah, that's, and it's going to happen through the phones. Uh, it's it's going to be just like Pokemon Go. That's how AR is going to get introduced, and and then it's eventually going to move to a headpiece that's not uh, as obstructive as 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 VR is. Uh, it's it's inherently separating. The technology is by design isolating. Is it going to be Google Glasses? Uh, yeah. Well, uh, Google Glass freaked people out, but we're all going to get used to it. We're all going to get over the fact that we're all on camera all the fucking time. Like, we are. All the time. You know, part of me hopes for that somewhere because I, I would hope at some point that if everyone just realizes you are perpetually on camera, that people would act not nearly as fucking stupid as they do in public. Well, let's not get hasty. <laughs> I know it's lofty goals. I recognize this, but, but yeah, no, it's uh, and and there without that expectation, you know, without that though, we we wouldn't have YouTube be as successful as it was. We had, wouldn't have World Star. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, you know, it's so that but the paranoia and the fear, like that, there was the pushback to Google Glass. It was really twofold. One, it was way too fucking expensive yes right yeah you know, and that's that's to be expected like i wasn't interested in google glass version one i'm interested in google glass version 10 you know i i want them to refine that so cheap that they're giving them away in china <laughs> that's that's what i'm on board like when the technology is ubiquitous, that's what I'm gonna be. Yep, yeah, I'm gonna have that thing. And but the you know the, the two stumbling blocks that they're gonna have to that is a bringing the price down and b making sure everyone's kind of down with the fact that everybody's filming everyone all the time. And I, I used to have an illusion of privacy, and now I just kind of don't 
give a shit. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think part of that is like, I have a, I have an open windows philosophy. I keep my windows open and I walk around my house naked. And if you don't like that, why the fuck are you looking in my windows? Thank you. Why are you looking in my windows? Mind your own goddamn business. Did you get, did you point your camera at my direction and catch my dong? Well, great. Now you've ruined your footage because my dong's in it. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. So, but I understand at the same time that just because I have no expectation of privacy and I have no fears about everything I do being monitored, that not everyone feels the same way. And some people are actually doing like significant, important stuff that they need to keep from prying eyes for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. And so that, that resistance is going to be ongoing uh, and it's, it's going to be a battle and we're going to be uh, dealing with it for a long time and fooling ourselves, I think, um, in some ways in terms of how we're being monitored and how we're not being monitored. But um, I know that if I wanted to like feel secure that no one was watching me or listening to anything I was saying, uh, I'd be collecting everyone's cell phone at the door and there would be nothing technological in the room. You have to make people actually talk and interact. And yeah, well, yeah, I mean, that's, 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 but that's, you know, I'm sorry, but that's really pretty much just reserved for my secret political meetings. Right. <laughs> like and there, you know, that's, that's the, uh, I, I, there's a, an SJW conspiracy. I don't know if you're aware. Um, there's an SJW conspiracy out there. We meet on Thursdays and, uh, uh, you know, in a windowless room where we can't be monitored and, and plot, uh, how we're going to, uh, overtake all media. <laughs> Good luck that's, with uh, that. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's what's going on. That really, that really happens. Yeah. No, um, I've been to the meetings. They are fantastic. They're fantastic yeah. Oh yeah. Every Try aspect. the dip. Oh, <laughs> it. My God. Sue's <laughs> French is to die for. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's so, but yeah, I think I, Cameron, I can't I stand you. I tried to recipe from her and she would talk. <laughs> oh, oh my goodness, just the way that you said <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh I mean, my Nintendo, goodness. So Nintendo's going to have games at E3. Um, and all the first party stuff is going to be stuff that everybody's like, Oh my God, that's so brilliant. Uh, except, except they're going to have one game in that Nintendo direct that nobody knew about. And it's for a beloved franchise that they haven't focused on in a long time. Geist. And it's going to be not anything anyone wanted. Universes two. Like that's that's that, that's just that's my prediction for Nintendo, like you know similar to how they did like a Metroid Prime Hunters, that nobody fucking wanted. They wanted a Metroid game, they didn't want that Metroid game. So I was okay with Hunters. I had an issue with Federation Force. Oh, Federation. Okay, whatever. They're all the same to me. <laughs> it, they're not. They're not two D Metroids. So. Who Do cares? you think with everything uh, roiling around that we get that Metroid announcement this year at the show? I don't know. I, I don't think Nintendo cares about Metroid, if I'm being totally honest. So uh, it I, feels like it anymore. It's it's a second tier series for them. Um, and what, what was the, the Wii one that everybody got upset about? Oh, the other with the cut. Yeah, other M, which I still haven't played. I have a copy of it. Haven't, haven't played. I enjoy played. other M. I think at the time, you know, some of the people who were disappointed. Yeah, the story. There were some story problems, but I'm just like, look, I would rather oh, have so Team Ninja. I mean, I would have Team Ninja, Ninja, you know, work on a game like Metroid, and 
you know, have like fixed camera angles and, you know, some good action didn't play Ninja Gaiden 2 where you could barely see anything. Like, Tecmo was bad at cameras in their games. And it kind of seemed like with other M, that was all fixed. Like, they learned to how actually to work a camera in an action style game. Yeah. Yeah, I, it's, I, I'm interested to play it, but I think that after that didn't do as well as they would have liked, I, I really think that was a, a nail in the coffin on Metroid. Uh, it, then, you know, they do Federation and you know, nobody was really interested. And that doesn't, I think, reinforce for them a lot of um, uh, trust and expectation in the IP. So I think uh, everybody wants it to be like Super Metroid, and I'm just like, you guys got to move past that. I think I don't, I don't, I don't disagree that it would be nice for people to move past that. Mm -hmm. I guess, but that's what I'm actually interested in. I mean, it. If I'm going to play a, a Metroid game, that's that's what I'm looking for in it. And if they don't want to make that, that's fine. Like I'm not I'm not upset. Make make whatever you want. Because the Lord knows there's no shortage of games out there for me to go and buy that you know are going to appeal to my interests. So yes. That's okay. Yeah. But you know, like I I didn't enjoy Prime. Really, it was okay. Uh. I, I I respected that they could convey the things that made Metroid Metroid in a first person shooter game. Mm -hmm. I, I I and I I thought it was really interesting. It's lore delivery through scanning, and you know the, there were there were good ideas in that game. It's it is not anything against the game other than it's not the sort of game I want to play. It's and just, your itch. Right, yeah, it's I, I I'm not I'm really not into first person perspective games. Uh, I have a a problem with my disconnect from the screen. Um, I have issues with the the reuse of textures and environments uh, because I can't keep track of where I am, um, and and a lot of my you know uh, ability to sort of geolocate is based on experience and repetition, you know, going through an area multiple times and I get lost. So like I get, uh, I get really mad at games that have shitty maps. Oh, uh, Borderlands and Borderlands 2. I hate they maps and they yeah. game. But at least they do. They they have topography in their maps, don't they? To some extent, in a or is way, that the problem with them. The problem with it is like they'll show a pinpoint on a map. You go there, but when you get to that part, they don't show you how to get into actually where that thing is at. So you could be right. searching around, and because sometimes of the textures being so like meshed together, you didn't even know that's like an interest there. And you just be like. Where in the world is this thing at? So you could spend literally 10 to 15 minutes searching that whole area trying to find that thing. You know, because the yeah. map is just flat. When you get to the actual area, you, you got to search it. You got to look for it. And sometimes it's not even there. Right. So yeah, I had the issue with the map in Bioshock. Because there was a game that was set up like Metroid Prime, but the map for it just completely disconnected from it for me. Like, mm -hmm. the map in Prime worked so well because they gave you, you know, a nice 3D rendered map that you could kind of understand how everything laid out yes. together, see how it pieced together. And Bioshock just took everything 3D and flattened it. You know what had a great map that was completely fucking useless? Metal Gear Solid 2. Yeah. I great agree. map. Great map. Like, full 3D rendering of the big shell, and you could zoom around, and you could, like, pinpoint your... You didn't need it. It had no function. <laughs> there was no purpose. You didn't need a map. Ah, oh, just kills me. No, I... So, yeah, I don't, I don't do a lot of first-person shooter games. Uh, oh, if I play them, they need to be really linear. Like, they need to sort of, like, handhold me. It's like, okay, now go here. Okay, now go here. I'm the guy that everyone bitches about. Like I'm the <laughs> casual who who really cannot be bothered to get to to uh, I also don't use keyboard and mouse. Uh -huh. 
play t- I play almost all my shooters on uh, PC. PC. Yeah, but I use a controller. <laughs> you and me in the same boat. I just I can't deal with uh, I, mouse and keyboard. It's not for me. I can't it, play PC at all. I mean, there's some games that I have. Surprisingly, I beat Grand Theft Auto Three on PC. I don't know how, but I can't. I, I'm such a console person. I used to. I used to be able to do keyboard and mouse uh, back uh, in the late '90s mm-hmm. when I was playing a lot of Quake Two. Um, and controller binding sucked. Um, but now everybody's figured out how to use controllers, and they're pretty good. And I no longer have to, like, injure my wrist by maintaining my hand at WASD, um, which I can't do for more than, like, 10, 15 minutes. Yeah. Uh, it just it starts to ache. And uh, I don't know if that's, like, something I should go see a doctor about. But I can't do it. I, I, I need a con- I need a controller uh, unless unless the game just provides me no alternative. And then, damn, that game had better be good. That game had better be good, like Factorio good. Mm-hmm. It's got to be real good uh, if I'm going to use a keyboard and mouse. Does it need to be nifty and good, or just good? No, just good. It just has to be really good. I I. I mean, if, if, if it's if it's short enough, it doesn't even have to be that good. Like you get it short enough that, uh, like, under ten minutes, you know, like, just enough time for me to not get annoyed. Uh, fine, it can be bad. Yeah, I'm all right with that. <laughs> ten I'm okay with app is tolerable. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Look, pain is fine if it's short lived. Yeah. 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 It's it's the long pain that that hurts it's you know like um my my father has has lost his his mind like to a certain extent he's like he's just he's old he lost his memory uh he played football as a a kid a lot uh played through high school took a lot of hits uh his dad did the same thing they both developed mental disorders later in life So my father's memory is just shot, right? Uh, He's fine, right? Uh He's fine because for him it was just a switch. You know, he's occasionally confused, and 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 you have to do the math with him to convince him that he's seventy years old and he still doesn't believe you. But he's fine. My mom, however, that's the long pain. She's got to live with it. Yeah. So short and awful. I'll take that any day over something that's long and painful. Uh, like, um, uh, any fantasy RPG. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like Final Fantasy 7? No, you see, but 7, I have a softness in my heart for. Uh, yes. And I have act- I, I've played through it multiple times. Uh, I could probably today start that game and play through it, okay. but uh, but by and large, actually, yeah. I mean, if a game if a game requires me to play ten hours to see a conclusion, that's about my upward limit. Okay. Um, now that doesn't mean I I won't play games for hundreds of hours. I just need to be able to find a conclusion within the first 10. Um, I, I have, I've sort of begged off RPGs in general. Um, open world games have become like things that I loved, but have become just too vast. Games have become too big for me. Uh, they feel like too much of an investment. I have Horizon Zero Dawn um, and I, I really bought it for my wife because I knew that I wasn't going to wind up playing it. And I've put in about three hours. Have you guys played it? I did. I, I have I have to. I'm close to the end. I just got to finish it. Um, okay. Well, you remember how long it took you? To, you? You remember the proving? Yes. I haven't done that yet. Oh, you still? Oh, goodness. You still at the beginning of the game. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm about three hours in. I haven't done the proving yet. 
See, I, I can understand it. I, I it, it feels super daunting when every game wants to be so big that it wants to be the only game in your life. But the right. pro- but the problem with some open world games is that it literally gets repetitive in the first hour, two hours. And even as you, as you advance in the story, it's still repetitive. Like, you're still doing the same things. And, and I got to level with you. Most of the stories suck. <laughs> yes. Like, this is a story. That's part of that is you're dragging out uh, a, a story that could be told very effectively in five or six hours over the course of a 40 to 60 hour epic. Um, and, and that's, you know, a lot of that, it's just gameplay padding, you know, it's repetition, it's grinding enemies. So, you know, it's doing the same repetitive tasks over and over again. And then the the payoff, I'm sorry, it's fluff for the sake of fluff. It is, it is. And the payoff then doesn't tend to be that good. Certainly there are exceptions. Um, you know, you, the, the persona games are, as I have been told, very, very good. But uh, I played Persona 4 for 20 hours, and God, I'll be damned if I have any idea what was going on in it, because it just dragged out over a period, and you can't set it down, because you take a week off, you come back, and you're like, well, what, what, what the, the hell was I doing? Oh, I was just killing monsters. You know, I, I didn't. I didn't finish Lost Odyssey, and I was really into it. That's what I, I need lost to start. At some point. I need to start Lost Odyssey. I got lost at some point. Uh, I wasn't sure which place I was supposed to go to next. I tried like two, three times to get back into it, and that was the end of it. Um, it, the, and when the payoff isn't going to be worth it, and I know the payoff's almost never going to be worth it. Oh, what, 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 why? Why am I doing that? When I could play 50 games of Flint Hook. Ah, uh, the game I need to amount. get. I need to get that game. It looks so that, good. It is very good. Um, I I just reviewed it uh, for the Jimquisition dot com, a fine website with many fine reviews. Um, yeah, and 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 gave it a a nine. I I, I love the physics in it. Um, Tribute is is one of my favorite developers right now. Um, they just had Curses and Chaos on, on PlayStation Plus, and I was so happy because I, I hadn't gotten around to getting that, mm-hmm. so got that now. And uh, Mercenary Kings is great. Wizorb is really good. Um, and, and I'm pleased to see that they are sort of uh, not toning down their difficulty, but their difficulty is becoming a little more well-balanced. Flint Hook is great difficulty balance. Um, not great difficulty progression. There is a difference. Uh, it, it sort of runs into a, like a stage progression problem where there are these sharp difficulty spikes between sets of stages and then you get to the last set of stages and it's very long and as a result of its length and internal difficulty progression, it's actually much easier than like the two sets of stages that preceded it just because you have more time to like get power-ups and stuff like that. A- anyway, really good game on the whole. A lot of uh, I've had a lot of fun with that. Yeah, I, I was I was it. playing it right before we started recording. Actually, I managed to squeeze in one more run. <laughs> I'm trying to achieve a score target on a certain level, and I keep missing it by a few thousand points. Oh no! Oh yeah, it's, it's true. I I get into those kinds of things. Like that's what I like uh, little, little score challenges. Um, <clears throat> Vlam Beer is another developer that uh, I I will. I will play just about, I, I will play anything they make. Um, and and that that started with Super Crate Box. You guys played Super Crate Box? I heard of it. I haven't tried it yet. It's free on Steam. You just just go download it. Okay. It is a an incredibly pure distillation of a Mario style game. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and by Mario style, I mean original Mario Brothers, the arcade game, uh, with the sort of static one uh, screen yeah. room. I used to own that for uh, uh, Atari 2600. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, it's, 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 it looks very visually close to that, actually. I mean, the, the first stage design in Super Crate Box is 
is very clearly lifted from Mario Brothers. Um, and you have guns, basically, and, and the monsters come out the top and they work their way down to the bottom. And every time a monster makes it down to the bottom, it comes back out the top meaner. Um, and, and until they eventually start, you know, chasing all of their own little uh, patterns. But you don't score points for killing the enemies. The enemies are just there to be dealt with. They're just obstructions. You score points every time you pick up a crate. And so there's always one crate on the screen. And you, basically your goal is to get to the crate, pick up the crate. But every time you pick up a crate, it switches your gun to a random one of the guns. Okay. And one of the guns is the disc gun. And it's the disc from Tron, right? And I, I, I'm now firmly behind this. Okay. And it bounces off walls, and that's the one that can kill you. Oh, uh, dang. <laughs> so they have this balance of all of these, like, crazy weapons. Uh, and and you get a weapon, and it's, you, like, you get an awesome weapon, and that's great because, okay, cool, I can clear out these enemies. But I'm going to lose it as soon as I pick up that crate, and I've got to pick up that crate because the most important thing is to score. And you only score by getting crates and putting yourself at risk. It is a brilliant, brilliant oh, wow. first game. From for for uh, and that's why I will play everything they make because it demonstrates such a a clear understanding of core platforming gameplay, and and, and yet just just all it does is twist scoring. That's it. That's all it does is twist mm. how you score. It's mm. that simple. And they, uh, for an April Fool's joke, the year after it came out or, or something, they released an update for it uh, as an April Fool's joke uh, where they fixed the scoring. Oh. And you now scored points for killing enemies instead of collecting crates. <laughs> and I think, I think somewhere on a hard drive, somewhere, I still have a copy of that build. Like they nice. only made it available for the one day on their website and then it was gone. Um, they did a similar thing with Nuclear Throne. Uh, they turned it into a first-person shooter at one point for April Fools. That's kind of how uh, that's with me. With wait for anything they release, I want to own and I want to play because yeah. they're like the they're like the Capcom and Konami that I used to know back in the day, and they just still to this very day make quality titles, and I just love them for just their their development it's just their game well they have a an attention and like because their original property stuff is always really good yes but even even their licensed work uh there's uh, there's a, a real effort that goes in that you don't see at other studios that have a tendency to do a lot of licensed work um the way forward team is tr tremendously talented and uh and put out product at an impressive rate too like they oh, get, good. they really push out games. Yes. I'm, I'm a little surprised. I mean, as long as it's not a Shantae. <laughs> that last Shantae game was excellent. Oh, Have Jenny Hero was just, mwah, so good. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'm sorry. I own the Wii U version with the soundtrack. I had to have it. And I, I played that game maybe with I like I played part of it and then the next day that I was off from work I played it straight like for the almost like six to seven hours and just enjoyed every minute of it. Ah, they do great work. Yeah, I like the Mighty Switch Force games too. Those are fantastic. Yes. I had a ball with those. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I I hate to do it because I've had far too much fun with this, um, but. We're, we're hitting a point where we've got to wrap because otherwise it's going to be a beast of a bitch to edit <laughs> later. Um, uh, yeah. So, uh, Conrad, uh, you are the guest. Uh, please take it away. Pimp your shit first. Oh, uh, okay. Well, um, yeah. I mean, if you tolerated this much rambling, uh, you can... Uh... <laughs> You can find some more rambling on my on my Twitter feed. That's uh, at Conrad Zimmerman. Um, and you can... Uh, find my audiobooks at conradzimmerman.com and go to go. But, but if you do one thing, if you do, if you do one thing, just one thing, just one, go to fistshark.com, F I S T, like the, 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 the thing that can you can make with your hand, 
yeah. and you hold it up in, in, in solidarity or insert it into an orifice. Shark, S-H-A-R-K, the, the, the predator that, that cannot stop moving lest it die. Fistshark.com. Check out the podcast and, and maybe, maybe laugh or, or maybe send me messages about how I shouldn't make jokes about politics uh, and how you're really only there for the, the, the sharp video game commentary, of which there is none actually there's 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 no I, you know what actually it's not true we just did a bit about video games <laughs> Fuck. we uh yeah we 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 made it a point not to do video games in that show and we just kind of broke that rule uh i i gotta ask real quick it's it's being demanded of me that it's being asked of you um was there she wants to know was there ever anything that Sterling said, did in in your time with him that you ever finally just looked at it and went, I think we went too far. Oh no. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh no. Yeah. We go, we go too far often. Um, and that's, that's like one of the great gifts of, of doing a, a show like fish shark, which is highly edited. It's very, it's, it's thoroughly edited. Um, we're, we're quick, maybe not always that quick, right? We tighten up some of those gaps, uh, the, the, you know, to make it as a workable show. Uh, and, 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 and boy, do we delete some things. Now, <laughs> I, I'll level with you. I'm usually the one who goes too far. What? I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, because... I I could see it actually. Uh, yeah, I can I can go into a dark place and I'm perfectly okay going there and then afterwards saying was that okay? Like did did I did I I won't stop myself from saying it for the sake of making the joke. Mm -hmm. But I will stop myself from letting anyone else hear it after it's uh, like, So yeah, it's it's actually more often me. I will say something to where we're both like, "Oh, that might offend more people than it makes laugh." Maybe we shouldn't say that. Uh, but and 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 it's again, it's usually not me that tells Jim he's going too far. Uh, it's Jim who tells Jim he's going too far. Uh, it just happened. We did a fish shark recording this morning. And uh, he was running along with a joke and 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 he came to a determination shortly after he said this joke that it could be interpreted by certain people to suggest that we were implying a certain event, which we did not want to imply. Or he felt we didn't need to imply that I probably would have let it, you know, it's, uh, uh, you know, he doesn't get the emails. I don't know why he. Like, <laughs> Oh wow! I I don't get the emails either. That's actually that's the best part. Like, I we so say I some... another question. You just told me he doesn't get the emails, which explains why I've never heard anything back from him. Yeah, yeah, I get the emails. <laughs> I've tried to reach out to him actually. Oh well, uh, yeah. I mean, in terms of like, I I don't know. I don't. I I don't know how he deals with his inbox. His it, that that's got to be a world all into itself. I, the thing I don't miss about like writing about video games all the time is having like an unread email list that's five digits. Oh God! Like and that that happens easily. It's not hard. So I don't. Yeah, I I. We all winded. We would all wind up filtering just to high heaven, and it's so easy for things to get missed or overlooked in the in the floods. So, yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't presume to guess why he would see. But he, yeah, I mean, I send him emails and don't get responses all the time. That's yeah. You know, that's just that's just the way it is. I we, we all find our methods of getting through to Jim, um, one way or another. But yeah, no, he. Yeah, after he he made a joke and you know, and we went with it for like two, three, four minutes. Yeah, you know, and these are like twelve minute bits that we do. So I mean, it was a good stretch of time that we were allowing this thing to sort of sit there and fester. 
<laughs> and afterwards, he's just like, maybe I shouldn't have used that word. Maybe I should have used this word. Because that word, that kind of suggests this thing, doesn't it? And I was like, well, I mean, it is sort of inextricably linked in some ways that that thing was used for that thing. And I can see how someone would, 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 would hear you talk about that thing and infer this thing. Sure. But, but you know, I mean, so, and, and so then I had to have him say the word liquid like seven, eight times, various intonations, so that our poor editor can fix where he said the other word. Wow. I don't envy him. I don't envy him. I, 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 that's, I don't miss. I, like, the first 50 episodes of Fish Shark were edited by someone uh, wonderful uh, that we were so lucky to have, Nick Malone, great guy. Uh, and after 50 episodes, he was like, I can't do this anymore. <laughs> I... I got a real job, you know, like, well, he was, he had time when he came to, to do it. Uh, he was a stay at home dad. He was doing so, a little bit of freelance work here and there, but it wasn't a big deal. And he's like, yeah, I'd love to edit this show. And that was great. And then he got a job and he's like, I'm making real money and there's, this will never make money for me. I'm like, no, it will not, sir. It will never make money. This is it's it is going it's going to be a, a shoestring thing forever, and so we had to say goodbye to him. And then I had to edit the show for fifty episodes, and I never want to do it again. Like I will, I will always pay someone else to edit audio <laughs> if I can. If I can find some way to pay someone to edit the audio, so I don't have to do it. So I don't, I don't envy the task you had to have ahead of you, sir, for this it's mess. Not terrible, truthfully. I, I try not to put too much effort into editing it, but just just enough so it sounds usually tolerable to listen to for the you know four to five people that listen to the show on a week to week basis. <laughs> well, but they love it, right? The four to five people love it. I, I certainly hope so. They well, I mean, it could be a different five people every episode. True. This is true, or it could be it's the same five people, but they're all a bunch of masochists, and that's why they hate coming listening. back. Right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I don't get a lot of email uh, for Fish Shark, but I do, I do read it all, and we have offended some people, like really seriously, like really seriously offended people, Legit- legitimately. And I feel kind of bad about that on some level. Not enough to stop. (laughs) I don't think I've offended anybody on here enough, at least that I know of, because nobody fucking emails us about it. But so, I mean, if I've offended somebody, they they either kept listening and not said anything or they just tuned out. The the thing that I've gotten the most complaint about. Out of all of the stuff that we've done over the years me and jim and jonathan you know and all the podcasts all of the just like offensive offensive shit that i've i have said done or participated in on some level we did a bit on fish shark called 50 shades of christ <laughs> <laughs> oh fantastic uh, it's in the episode prepper camp if anyone wants to you know Go get I a have got right, to find it. In, it, in it. <laughs> it is, uh, I mean, in my mind, it is among our finest, finest work. I must uh, say, it, as a it, Christian, it, as a Christian, I'm looking forward to this because I could, I could laugh at stuff like this. I, I, yeah, I, yeah. I mean, you know, it's and and I don't want to belittle anybody's faith. Like, no, you, no. Anybody believe whatever you want to believe. As I, far as I'm concerned, it's. It's all good. I can't it's wait fine. to I can't wait to hear it because at this court, you're probably gonna say some stuff that I'm literally gonna agree with, and it's probably be stuff that well, no, I've I mean, seen the, in the church. That I'm just gonna be like, I mean, the title yeah. kind of says it all, right? Like it's it's you know in in I think in the the bit we're we're trying to sex up the Bible basically. <laughs> um, and and I mean, in the crucifixion, man. I mean, from a I mean, painting the crucifixion as a sadomasochistic fantasy, like there's there's fertile ground there. Oh, yeah, mm, yeah, like that that can work. 
Um, yeah. Yes. So yeah, go to check, go, go check out fist chart. I'm done pimping my stuff. You can end your show. <laughs> Eddie pimp your shit. Well, you guys can follow me on Twitter at that retro code. You guys can follow world one, one podcast at world one underscore one podcast. You can uh, hear my show optional opinion on SoundCloud, iTunes, Google play, and the anomalous video network dot com or any other podcast apps. You can hear my other podcast, Nintendo Power Block, that I do with my friend Corey on NGRradio.com. You can read my blogs on IGN uh, under anime, E N I M E. That's my optional opinion blogs. Um, and also read The Moment, uh, where I talk about retro games and how they play a part in my life at skirmishfrogs.com. And you can hear World One One podcast at shoutsengine.com. Yes, Conrad, that's how busy I am. I do like multiple yes, podcasts. Yeah, busy the week. man. Yeah. Eddie is officially the the internet's biggest podcast whore. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, he no seriously pe- is. <laughs> can I tell you, optional opinion is just me on the mic talking, and it's a por- it's a show that. I bring uh, a, a just a topic that not nobody really is talking about. I bring an opinion, but I also bring options. And I play, like, music bits for breaks and stuff. So, um, and it's like an hour show. So, if you wow. can't, yeah. I do have some guests sometimes, but most of the episodes, it's just me talking in the mic and giving my opinion about stuff. You go. So. That's that awesome. I'm going to cool. check that out. It's like the Rush Limbaugh video game podcast. It's just him on the mic. Yeah, I actually did. A, I actually did one where uh, different people call uh, can video games help your sex life, and um, and I normally do like the beauty of video games, like every September where I'll talk. I actually talk positive about video games across the, all the whole medium with different guests. Just like what is the beauty of video games that we love? Like just squash any negativity, but what's the beauty of? It? So and other, and then let's just talk about other weird stuff in video games. No, that's I think we need more of that. Actually, that was something that Jonathan Holmes and I, like uh, after Sub Holmes ended, uh, we were kicking around the idea of, of of like doing a site that was just positive. It was only positive. It was no no negative. I think it was Sugar Bears is what he wanted to call it at one time. <laughs> and it was just yeah, it was just positivity surrounding video games all the time. And, you know, that whole, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything. And we just wouldn't cover things, we had negative things to say about. It would be easy. The easiest thing in the world to just stay positive. And then I thought about it. And I was like, holy crap, that's really hard. Yeah, it is. Like, that's really hard to stay positive all the time. I, I don't think I'm built that way. Like, it seemed so simple. But then you look around, I can complain about fucking anything. And that's my first impulse. Like, immediately, it, I see it, something. That's most gamers' first impulse is to bitch about something. Yeah. This is wrong. I perceive a wrongness here. Yeah. Yeah. We all have forever the sense of entitlement that the industry owes us something. Oh. And but, then uh, when they do give it to you, folks don't even go out and support it. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to say we're screwed. So, great show, everybody. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, final pimping again. You find World 1-1 uh, at our home on Shout Engine, of course, on iTunes, uh, Google Play Music, uh, also, you know, part of the uh, DNA Network, and uh, coming soon to the NGR Radio Network. Uh, also find us out on uh, Podchaser, uh, Podknife. Um, on that, uh, click like on the Facebook page. We've still got a few copies of Axiom Verge, actually, to give away, so that's still perfectly valid. So if you know Tom Hap's favorite breakfast cereal, send it in a, send it in a message to us at World 1-1 uh, on the Facebook page, Can, and I will send you a free copy of the fucking game. Conrad, what is your favorite breakfast cereal, or breakfast item, I should say? Damn it, I was going to try and dodge the you asking this. <laughs> uh, I don't, I don't, uh... okay, well. Are you asking me what my favorite food item traditionally associated with breakfast is? Or are you asking me what my favorite thing to have as a breakfast meal is? Either, so those either, are two different things. Either or. Anything that okay, got to do with breakfast. breakfast. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. I don't, uh, eat, I don't eat breakfast. I tend not to eat lunch. I typically 
Uh, I get up around 8.30 in the morning and I drink coffee until about 1 p.m. Um, and then sometime around 5, 36 o'clock, I make dinner. Okay. Any favorite snack, at least? Uh, ever since I moved back to Pennsylvania, um, I've had ready access to Tasty Cake brand uh, <gasps> iced chocolate cupcakes. Yeah. And that was that was something that I had around like growing because I was born in Pennsylvania and uh, then my family moved to Phoenix in 1990 and you couldn't get tasty cakes out there. Oh, and then you could get them. They, there was started to be one supermarket chain that carried tasty cakes in a few locations and you could get them, but they weren't fresh. Like they weren't they weren't fresh in the way that like I buy a tasty cake here and it's squishy. Uh, it's it is like, you know, one week past the sell by equivalent. Um, and so now I get those. And actually, I'm going to visit my father uh, for his birthday next week. And I'm bringing him just boxes of tasty cakes. It's like the easiest, easiest gift. It's great. He's impossible to shop for. But uh Tasty cakes, yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm. That's. I have a, a, yeah. I have two chocolate cupcakes and a uh, half a pint of milk. Okay. Larry. Right. Well, I, I think we've we've covered it, uh, Conrad. I want to thank you for you know. Yay! Oh, thank you guys. For, you know, wasting Look. it if uh, if it was no good for you. No, yo, it's it's it, you, 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 I, I get an email. They say, do you want to come to do this thing? I say, sure. Then they praise me for two hours <laughs> and let me talk about whatever the hell comes through my brain. Like, this was a pretty good deal for me. Like, this works out <laughs> fine for me. I hope it was good for you. <laughs> we had a great time. Yes. You're, of course, welcome to drop in anytime you damn well please. Well, thank you. <laughs> it was fun. Well, All right. well, everyone, thank you for tuning in. Um, we will see you again uh, next week, actually, uh, just in the works. And we're going to be recording a little bit early this week, but it'll still go up on Monday next week. Uh, we'll be joined by Pierre Schneider, if everything goes exactly correct. So with that, everybody, we will see you next time on World War One Podcast. Bye. Bye.